Hello, friends. Welcome. We're just waiting for folks to come in. Yes, welcome, everyone. Great to be here. Especially since we're at a new time today, so we really appreciate you showing up early and joining us, joining us midday on a Monday. It's exceptionally midday if you live in California. <laughs> <laughs> Less midday for the for the East East Coast folks. All right. Yeah. All right, James, you want to kick us off? Sure. So welcome everyone to Stubborn Praise. I'm James Cruz and I'm here with my co-host Rosemary Watola Tromer. And uh, we have a special guest today, Mark Nepo, who is here to share poetry, wisdom, his spirit with us. We're so grateful for that. And um, we, we also want to let you know that Mark will be leading a webinar this summer called Life of Expression. So um, you can go to live.marknepo.com to find out more information about that. And, um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll get started. I'll read a few poems. Rosemary will share some, and then uh, we'll hand things over to Mark for a while and uh, then come back together a little bit more at the end. Please let us know if you have any uh, questions for any of us, any comments. Um, please feel free to place those in the in the chat. And um, so I actually want to get started with a, a poem that uh, uses a quote from one of Mark Nepo's books, actually the most recent one, I think it's the most recent one, um, The Book of Soul, which is a, a favorite and really helped me through the pandemic, actually. Um, so this one, this poem of mine is called The Clearing, and it begins with the epigraph, there are waves of stillness and peace that wait in the spaces of our agitations and fear. And so I was thinking about that the past few days that there's stillness and space at the center of fear. Uh, I love that. So this is the clearing. At the center of every fear is a clearing. And though you must trudge for miles in the dark woods to get there, it's worth the trip. Now you can sit down for a while among grass and hawkweed. You can bask in unfiltered light and feel the heavy clouds shifting overhead. At the center of every fear, if seen completely, is an empty space where the wind tickles the hairs on your neck, then arcs an arm around your shoulder pulling you closer like a father, at last unafraid to show affection, here to let you know you're not alone. And then uh, another poem, this, was, this one came to me as I was walking through the woods, uh, maybe a, a couple weeks ago now, um, here in Vermont, and spring always means watching for the ephemerals, the wildflowers, and one of my favorites is the trout lilies. They have these wonderful speckled leaves, and um, so I'm always looking for those. And uh, this is Consider the Lilies. This is the unbreaking news. Today on my walk, I saw hundreds of trout lilies breaking through leaf litter, their spotted green leaves nearly translucent in the sun, pointed upward like spears, already turning the leftovers of this last difficult year into fertilizer, into food. Consider these lilies, how they never call themselves broken, simply because they had to live in darkness and cold for months how they don't have to be told to reach for the dappled light they know they need to bloom. So I'll turn it now over to Rosemary Watola Tromer. Thank you, James. I love that poem so much, the lilies. 
never call themselves broken. I read that line yesterday and I just, just went into bliss, really, orbits of bliss, thinking about what was possible if I didn't just keep naming myself broken. So thank you for that poem. I also want to thank Shift at Mile High. They are our sponsors and they're hosting this event and they host so many incredible events around mindfulness, including yoga and meditation, these poetry events and many others. And you can find out more about them at shift at milehigh.org. And I bet Carrie is there and she'll put that into the chat bar. And by the way, James, somebody was asking about your first poem, if you would put the title of it in the chat bar too. Well, I thought I'd start out with a poem that was inspired by Mark also. Um, this, it, this is not his newest book. In fact, it came out about 20 years ago, but this is the book that introduced me to him and truly changed and saved my life. It is not too dramatic to say that I really wasn't going to get through another day without reading this book every day. And, um, and one of the lines in that book is, the sound of your breath is the quietest of songs. Maybe on that day when we think, I forgot to sing, that's when we realize that all day long, we harmonized with the world in the quietest of songs, joined in without any effort, no striving at all. And maybe that is the day when we stop trying to be heard and start to notice the song inside every other song the song inside every other being, how perfectly in tune we are. How easily we join, no conductor, no notes, no beat, just one perfect air. Maybe that's the day we hear the metronome of our own steady heart and say to it, I will trust you, feel the truth of the song as it slips from our lips, then rushes in to fill us again. The breath is the quietest of songs. Man, Mark, that, that line has shifted things for me. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, this poem I wrote just last week, well, maybe a couple weeks ago now, I don't know. Sometimes there's a lot of stigma actually to being filled with wonder and awe. And it's almost as if it's more popular to be a cynic, uh, more popular to be a, a doomsday naysayer critic. <laughs> and uh, well, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> this is wonder. I wear my wonder like old running shoes, not elegant, not sophisticated, surprisingly inappropriate in certain rooms. I notice how others sometimes wrinkle their noses at a blatant sporting of wonder, at a blatant sporting of wonder, thinking perhaps I must be oblivious to the dress code, stilettos of apathy, high heels of indifference, boots of cool reserve. But dang, this wonder gets me everywhere I need to go, every inch, every mile, even across the room when everywhere I step is broken glass. Wearing this wonder is the only reason I can move at all. Hmm. Um, well, it's a joy to have Mark Nepo join us. And James, do you want to say a few words introducing him? Yeah, sure. So a lot of you probably already know who Mark is. Um, but uh, he's inspired readers and seekers all over the world with uh, the Book of Awakening, which Rosemary mentioned. It's a book that certainly saved my life as well and uh, many others. And, you know, I, I have to say that you can't pick up a Mark Nepo book without being inspired or without having it open a poem for you. Um, it, it's, it's just such a joy to read his work. And I was gathering together all of my Mark Nepo books and my husband was making fun of me for being such a crazy fan um, because I, I have them all. 
And uh, so I, I highly recommend his books and definitely we mentioned his webinar earlier. Um, I have attended talks and readings given by Mark and, you know, there's just this quality he has of being able to open, um, open other people creatively, spiritually, and uh, it's, it's a really beautiful talent. So um, we're grateful to have him here and to hear from him as well. I will stop embarrassing him now and uh, turn things over to Mark. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, James and Rosemary. Thank you both and sharing your wonderful poems and letting me be a part of, of this wonderful space you have. Um, welcome everyone. It's, it's important, you know, poetry, you know, William Carlos Williams had said many years ago that, you know, people are, uh, die, you know, dying for poetry when they're scrambling for the news, when they really need poetry. And, and, and I want to share that for me, poetry has become the unexpected utterance of the soul. The words are just the trail of it. And, um, and it has, and that pursuit of that that unexpected utterance has helped keep me alive all these years as well. So I want to share just you know, kind of, we'll see where they go, just a, a bunch of poems here. Um, this is called, If You Want a True Friend. If you want a true friend, just open your hands and say, I don't know. Say it softly and wait so your other can see that you mean it. Give them a chance to drop what they think is secret. Let them come up with a cup of what matters from the spring they show no one. Let them sigh and admit that they don't know either. Then you can begin with nothing in the way. Go on, admit to the throb you carry in your heart and let the journey begin. You know, I, I have found through the years that, that what I've been devoted to and what I had understood for so long is the creative process is really the internal process. It's not just reserved for poets or, or artists. There is a poet and artist in every one of us. And so this, this process, I feel like I retrieve poems more than author them. I'm not channeling, I give my all, but that being in conversation with life, if I'm authentic enough, rewards me with an insight or a question or a metaphor that then is my teacher and I have to be with it. Here's a poem called Inside Everything. Keep trying to hide and in time you become a wall Keep trying to love and in time you become love. Our journey on earth is to stop hiding so we can become love. Everything else is a seduction and a distraction. Courage is staying true. You know, I when I was... Uh, Many years ago, you know, many of you know from my writing, I almost died in my 30s from a rare form of lymphoma. And, you know, at that time, I was a driven young artist. And I was, you know, with all earnest sincerity, I was hoping maybe, maybe if I could, you know, work hard enough, I might, maybe I could write maybe one or two great poems, maybe. And then all of a sudden, I was in the hospital and thrown upside down and torn inside out. Well, forget writing great poems. I needed to discover true poems that would help me live. And now all these years later, I just want to be the poem. And the words again are the trail. So this poem, which was written more recently, this is called The Great Waters. In the beginning, I thought I was going somewhere. I thought we all were. But falling in while trying to cross, I finally understood the journey is to follow the river, all the rivers, especially the ones no one can see. 
The soul is a fish whose home is in those rivers. So I can take you across if you want, but the secret is to go everywhere by going nowhere. And I will be here when you fall in, which is not a failure, but an awakening. You know, we're, we're taught so much to get somewhere, <clears throat> to, that life is from here to there. But my experience has been that life is really from in to out, not from here to there. And I've also come to understand that I believe our heart is our strongest muscle. Um, I don't pretend to know how it works, but I can say my heart has never let me down. Even when I've been in grief or hurt um, or disappointed. And this is a poem called The Lesson. When young, it was the first fall from love. It broke me open the way lightning splits a tree. Then years later, cancer broke me further. This time it broke me wider the way a flood carves the banks of a narrow stream. Then having to leave a 20 year marriage, this, this broke me the way wind shatters glass. Then in Africa, it was the anonymous face of a schoolboy beginning his life. This broke me yet again, but this was like hot water melting soap. Each time I tried to close what had been opened, it was a reflex natural enough, but the lesson was of course the other way in never closing again. And I'm just going to let my dog out here. Uh, she's the humility factor. It doesn't matter what you read. When uh, she hears my wife, she needs to get to her. <laughs> but at, at the end of that poem about in, in never closing again. Now, there's a paradox because, of course, we need to open and close. We need to is this safe? Is this trustworthy? But, but deeper inside the heart, the heart never closes. The heart is our inner son. You know, the Sufi teacher, Hazrat Iniyad Khan said, God breaks the heart again and again and again until it stays open. And of course, once we're open, whenever we can open, once we're closed, teachers are everywhere. I, I love that in the Hindu tradition, there is a uh, term upa guru, which means the teacher that is next to you at this moment. So here's a poem uh, about a little fly that was a teacher for me. This is called At the Window. I was at the window when a fly near the latch was on its back spinning, legs furious going nowhere. I thought to swat it, but something in its struggle was too much my own. I kept, it kept spinning and began to tire. Without moving closer, I exhaled steadily my breath, a sudden wind, and the fly found its legs, rubbed its face, and flew away. I continued to stare at the latch, hoping that someday the breath of something incomprehensible would write me and enable me to fly. And so here's another teacher. This is a poem called Thinking Like a Butterfly. Monday, I was told I was good. I felt relieved. Tuesday, I was ignored. I felt invisible. Wednesday, I was snapped at. I began to doubt myself. On Thursday, I was rejected. Now I was afraid. On Saturday, I was thanked for being me. My soul relaxed. On Sunday, I was left alone till the part of me that can't be influenced grew tired of submitting and resisting. By Monday, I was told I was good. 
on Tuesday, I got off the wheel. Now, did I really get off the wheel? Of course not, because I'm human. So why did I end it there? Not that you should think better of me than I am, but because I believe poetry and all art, one of its deepest purposes is to marry what is with what can be. And I needed to end with something to aspire to. You know, we often, if, if we only stay with what is possible, we transcend the real and we kind of live in the clouds. And if all we do is stay faithful to what is, we can become uh, brokenly nihilistic. We have to marry what is with what can be. Well, here's a poem I want to share about grief. And there's been so much grief in the last year and loss and no one can escape it. And this was, you know, a few years back, maybe five years, six years now, but there was a, about an 18 month period where my wife, Susan and I went through a lot of loss. We lost in that period, her mother and both my parents and uh, a, a former dog child of ours and <clears throat> lost a mentor of mine. It was just a very deep, deep journey. And, and I, it was a summer day and I was sitting on our deck <clears throat> which was just beautiful. And, um, and I fell into this deep, deep moment of grief. And I was too exhausted to choose between the wonder of the day and the grief in my heart. And as has happened much as I've gotten older, I let them all in. And so this is a poem <clears throat> about both and the lesson from keeping my heart open to both. This is called Adrift. Everything is beautiful and I am so sad. This is how the heart makes a duet of wonder and grief. The light spraying through the lace of the fern is as delicate as the fibers of memory forming their web around the knot in my throat. The breeze makes the birds move from branch to branch as this ache makes me look for those I've lost in the next room, in the next song, in the laugh of the next stranger, in the very center under it all, what we have that no one can take away and all that we've lost face each other. It is there that I'm adrift, feeling punctured by a holiness that exists inside everything. I am so sad and everything is beautiful. Now, this is a good example of retrieving a poem, you know, following and it leading me to something I didn't know before I entered the poem and, and the expression, whether you again, whether you write it down or not. So being in this moment of both beauty and grief and staying with it, I, I didn't know where this was going. And at the end, I was rewarded for being staying authentic to that feeling. Yes, under it all in the center, what we have that no one can take away and what we've lost, they face each other. And it's there that I'm adrift, feeling punctured by a holiness that exists inside everything. I didn't know that and say, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful to end the poem there? I discovered that by exploring the truth of the feeling I found myself in. And that is what showed up. Now well, here's a, I have a few more poems here and, and we'll enter a conversa wonderful conversation together. And this poem has been a great teacher for me and I'm gonna read it twice because it's a short poem. It's called Mind as Keyhole. Mind as Keyhole. Beneath the cloud, everything is gray. Above the cloud, everything is light. Calling the cloud unfair, is being a victim. Trying to conquer the cloud is being a hero. Calling the cloud a cloud is the beginning of peace. Mind as keyhole. Beneath the cloud, everything is gray. Above the cloud, everything is light. Calling the cloud unfair is being a victim. Trying to conquer the cloud is being a hero. Calling the cloud a cloud 
is the beginning of peace. So I have two more pieces I'd love to share here before we uh, talk some. Uh, this is a, a recent poem called Under the Temple. <clears throat> the temple hanging over the water is anchored on pillars that nameless workers placed in the mud long ago. So never forget that the mud and the hands of those workers are part of the temple too. What frames the sacred is just as sacred. The dirt that packs the plant is the beginning of beauty. And those who haul the piano on stage are the beginning of music. And those who are stuck, though they dream of soaring, are the ancestors of our wings. And I, I do want to share this piece, which is kind of as a prose poem, and uh, it's called In Love with the World, and James kindly included it in his wonderful anthology, which um, I encourage you all to spend time with, to get and spend time with, How to Love the World. It's a remarkable gathering of, of voices uh, really from around the world. And this is called In Love with the World. And then we'll, we'll have a conversation. There is no end to love. We may tear ourselves away or fall off the cliff we thought sacred or return one day to find the home we dreamt of burning. But when the rain slows to a slant and the pavement turns cold, that place where I kept you and you and all of you, that place opens like a fist no longer strong enough to stay closed. And the ache returns, thank God, the sweet and sudden ache that lets me know I am alive. The rain keeps misting my face. What majesty of cells assembles around this luminous presence that moves around as me? How is it I'm still here? Each thing touched, each breath, each glint of light, each pain in my gut is cause for praise. I pray to keep falling in love with everyone I meet, with every child's eye, with every fallen being getting up. Like a worm cut into the heart, only grows another heart. When the cut in my mind heals, I grow another mind. Birds migrate and caribou circle the cold top of the world. Perhaps we migrate between love and suffering, making our wounded joyous cries alone, then together, alone, then together. Oh, praise the soul's migration. I fall, I get up, I run from you, I look for you. I am again in love with the world. Thank you, thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Hey, I have a question right off the bat. So in your poem, and this is for you too, James, you, in the poem, you know, two or three poems back, you said that learning to call a cloud a cloud is the beginning of peace. Forgive me if I paraphrased that. And, and this, this reminds me of, of this quote that, from Confucius that I've always kind of struggled and argued with. He says that true wisdom comes from learning to call a thing by its right name. And I think of this all the time with poetry about how it is that we struggle to name a thing with a poem, whatever it is, you know, loneliness or connectedness or frustration or benevolence and and we're trying to meet that emotion we're trying to meet that moment and the words almost touch it this is what i think like we almost name it we almost name it we almost name it and it slips away and i wonder do you think through poetry through language can we really truly touch a moment can we do that can we call a thing by its right name uh, well i think um i think i would you know for for me that confucius quote i would say not call it but feel a thing by its right name oh. and so there's a paradox for all of us in that 
you, you know, the value of na names for me are like bookmarks because the wonderful thing about poetry and, and about all art, but is the only things worth writing about are the things that can't be said. Right. But, oh my God, what beautiful things happen by our trying. And I remember being young and of course, like all, all young writers and poets, you know, <clears throat> I can remember, you know, um, seeing something and then trying to write about it, name it. And then I'd look at what I wrote and I'd look at what I saw and I'd go, I saw it, why can't I say it? And then I'd try again and I'd try again. And, you know, I can remember trying five, six times, seven times. And then I'd be so frustrated. I'd say, I can see it. Why can't I say it? Well, now all these years later, I don't think we ever say it. And, and I, but I look at it and now I write five, six, seven times. And now I look to what's unsayable and I go, thank you. <laughs> I never would have had these six or seven poems. Did you not shine for this moment in my heart? And so on the one hand, you know, the names are there so that we can touch what's elusive, mm -hmm. what's elusive. Um, but then, you know, Paul Valery, the French poet, you know, he said, he said something, I'm, I don't think I can quote this exactly, but he, he said something to the effect that, you know, to, to really see something, truly see something is to see it and forget its name. Oh. And, and it's not one or the other. It's both what you raised about Confucius and that, that, I, I say the word tree and it makes me look out my window, but then if I'm present enough and look at it long enough till it can be my upa guru, my teacher, I realize it's the, it get, I get under the name tree and I go, what is this thing growing out of the ground? Mm -hmm. This is incredible. And then, oh, it's a tree. Oh, yeah, exactly so. That was beautifully said. How about you, James? Yeah, I think it's similar for me. And I, you know, honestly, Mark has really helped with this because I really resonate with what he says about, you know, that strong desire and that strong drive to want to be like a so-called great poet or, you know, whatever that means, really. Um, but I think the more I practice and, and the older I get, um, that it's really, it is about finding the truest poem and just, you know, like, like Mark said, discovering that and then honoring the discovery, honoring whatever has passed through me. Um, and I think it is about being true to the feeling of a moment and using the language that we have to, I don't want to say capture it because I don't think you can capture it, but to maybe hold on to it for a little bit longer. I really feel like that's the purpose of poetry for me is to sort of grasp onto or hold on to what is unreachable or what is mysterious and, um, and to hold on to that for a little while, for as long as I can, and then to just let it go and let it be whatever, whatever has come. Um, you know, for me, it's usually the poems are teaching me how to be more present, like with that tree or what, you know, whatever it, like just a tree, um, but to be really with um, the people and the objects and the, the living beings around us. Um, I feel like the poems are always teaching me what I forget, you know, when I get caught up in busyness and um, my own distractions. Mm -hmm. There's a wonder, the Denise Levertov, some folks who may, if maybe they're not aware of her, she was a wonderful poet, <clears throat> died maybe 10 years ago, born in England, but spent most of her time here in America. But she had a poem called The Secret. I won't recite it, but basically it's about her. It's, I love it. it. It's about her giving a poetry reading at a university. And before the reading, two young just lit young women, you know, their souls are lit. They come running up to her and they go, oh, thank you, thank you. you we found the, the, the secret of life in one of your poems, in a line in one of your poems, thank you so much. And then they run away. 
and, and the poem goes on to say, wait, wait a minute. You didn't tell me the poem. You didn't tell me the line or the secret. Come back. And then she goes on to say, you know, I, I thank them for believing there is a secret and for finding it and losing it a thousand times. Yeah. And, and, you know, that again, beyond the written page, we all discover jewels and gems and then we spill them between each other and we need each other to make sense of them. Mm -hmm. Just because they come through us in the poems that we've shared today doesn't mean we have the, the secret of what they mean or what they carry. Mm. No, I often think too, just on this, you know, let's say that, you, you know, you wrote that poem about the cloud and let's just say that you did it. Let's just say you did, you perfectly touched what it is to be cloud and that there was nothing else then to be said about cloud. Like it really kind of cracks me up almost the idea that that's even possible. You know, thinking even of how many moon poems I've written, hundreds, hundreds of poems about the moon. I crack up every time I write another moon poem. I'm like, really? Another moon poem? May I never stop writing moon poems, you know, because, because the, the truth is of course that we, we do, we just touch it and forget it. Just, I love the way you said that. May we, may we know it and forget it know it and forget it may that secret appear and reappear and reappear every time yeah nicely said james do you have a question yeah i do i was going to ask mark just to follow up a little bit um you talked earlier about you know that desire to be the great poet and to write the great poems and then um, that sudden switch to writing the true poem so I, i'm just curious if that was if that was a switch or if you really struggled with that. I know that you were in academia for a number of years and you know the sort of work that academia rewards is not necessarily the work that we're talking about here. And so I wonder if that was a struggle for you, um, if it was a, a pivot to a different sort of um, creative community and creative outlook as a result. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So a couple of things there. And thank you for that question. So, you know, I think I always was striving to, to see the truth, to hear the truth, to try to be truthful. Um, and then we were all taught and installed with this notion of, well, of greatness of, you know, and, and it is not great, but true, not great, but true. And, um, and then, you know, uh, when I was in the hospital and, and when I was, you know, I turned to writing and expressing not for art. I, it was not, oh, this will be material, you know. I, it was the rope I climbed every day to keep me from falling off the cliff. And, and, and the words were just the trail. And then so once on the other side, I think I did, you know, um, I found uh, teaching, I, I always loved the classroom in whatever form, but, you know, I remember going back be before my cancer journey, I, I said I was a driven poet. And on the other side, I was so grateful to be here, but I woke up and I, I had lost my drive. Mm -hmm. It was gone. And that was disorienting because I felt, well, God, did I, where's my gift? Did I survive and not to have my gift? And where am I going? What do I, how do I? And it was very disorienting for several months until I started to realize I was drawn to things now, not driven. Oh. Which made all the difference in the world. Um, it allowed me to, it allowed for more joy. It allowed me for, uh, to have no boundaries in my investigations of life. And so going, I remember going back to teaching and I felt that the, the subject matter of, uh, that I was asked to confine myself to was everything was too small and narrow because everything was now in a felt holistic sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, it, it did, I really wanted to, to explore uh, the wholeness of life from every way in. And it's interesting, I've learned since, which is in one of my books, 
you know, we've, we, we talk about the academy and academics and it's, you know, and it's, it can have a connotation of being very narrow and sterile or highly intellectual. Um, but the, the word academy comes from Plato. Plato, and you know, we think of Plato, this great philosopher. Now remember Plato, 20, or 20, late 20s, early 30s, he's investigating the meanings of life. He doesn't have any kind of formal school or degree. People are just hanging out with him because they're interested and they're taking long walks, doing what we're doing here. And then his uncle who died left him an olive orchard about a mile north of Athens. And he said, cool. I think that was the original Greek. Uh, cool. <laughs> and uh, so he took all of this small tribe of interested compadres and students. They wanted to call themselves students. He didn't want to call them students. And they walked in the olive grove and had their conversations. And so the Greek word for academy means sacred grove. Mm. Yeah, wow. And, and we can recover that. Mm -hmm. We can recover that. And, 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 and poetry is the devotion to the sacred grove. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Oh, well, that's a definition of academy I could get around. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I want to teach. Yeah. I'm <laughs> at the <sacred> grove. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and it does seem to go back to that idea of having no boundaries, because I know, you know, that's been my struggle with being in academia, because I think, you know, if you're committed to being an authentic artist or writer, you could sort of reach this point where you don't work well within limits anymore. And you, you don't work well saying like, well, you can't write about the moon anymore. You know, there have been too many poems about the moon, which, you know, teachers have actually said to me in university settings. And, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. And, and I've, I've found the same to be true, but it, it's difficult to hold your ground when you're surrounded by those other limiting ideas. So I appreciate you putting that out there and giving us all permission to let go of some of those boundaries in our own way. We, we, we have to be true to, to what each of us sees. Mm -hmm. and, and without, you know, there's a wonderful, uh, in the Native American tradition, elder councils meet in circle and they still do today. And the reason of that is not just for equity because there's no head to a circle. They do that so that everyone has a direct view of the center. Mm. I love that because yeah. the assumption is we need everyone's view to grasp the center or whatever we put in the center. No one view is enough. And that's why, you know, if we have 20 people in the center, we need 20 and we put the moon in the center, we need 20 poems about the moon yeah. or whatever we put in the center mm -hmm. so that we get as many views as possible. And this is something that's sorely needed today. We need more viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is a, this is a little departure. I was, I was thinking about poems that I've read by both of you actually, and certainly poems that I've written to uh, in which we use the second person pronoun you, you know, Mark, you have a, the poem I was reading this morning. If you have one hour of air and many hours to go, you must breathe slowly. And, you know, I think there's this, I'm just curious when you write a you poem, how much of an idea do you have of who that you is and how much of that you is yourself and what, what goes into that second person pronoun perspective? Well, I, for, for me, and, and this is a, a huge uh, thing for me, is because I, it's all me. It's never you. <laughs> in, in the Sufi tradition, the Sufi tradition, Sufi poets often write in the, the you or they write and, and, and uh, 
<clears throat> will even in the fight, there's a tradition where they will even in the final line say their own name because mm -hmm. it's an instruction to them. They're receiving an instruction for them. And, and, and for me as a teacher and as a poet, I am a very uncomfortable writing in the imperative at all. And I, it's, I, I can't know, hardly know what makes sense for me, let alone you. And, but when I, but there are expressions where it feels to be more specific that you is necessary. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, it's, it's speaking to me. It's an instruction. It's like, you know, poetry also, the older I get is it's listening and taking notes. And so what I hear sometimes in that Sufi tradition is telling me, pay attention. If you do this, and then I, I share that, but I'm very uncomfortable with uh, being directive in any way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or directed. I don't particularly like that either. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> although there are poems, there are certain poems that I read and, and they're written in you know, command form and, and I don't rail against them at all. They just seem to soak right in. And I don't know what that difference is. In, in the, is it in the poet? Is it in me? Is it in the poem itself? I'm not sure. What do you think, James? How about you, that you-ness? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because we are driven to write in a certain way and in a certain form. And, you know, I, I'm definitely, I do have a habit of writing in the second person, but I'd say like Mark, it is, it has to be all me because if I'm giving instruction to someone else, if I'm trying to tell someone else how to live or what's going to work best for them, just like the fear poem I read, you know, that was in um, second person, but that's all about me and my fear. Um, you know, people are going to sense when you're trying to sort of tell them what to do and when it's not springing from your own experience. And so I think that's kind of the barometer for me of a poem like that, whether it really works is, you know, is that springing completely from me? And then I think in that situation, you're just creating something that's true and authentic. And then if someone else, you know, can apply it to their own life, then that's great, you know, that's perfect. But it started out with me. And I, I have a habit of titling those poems, Note to Self, but yeah. you can only use that title so many times. <laughs> uh, so people know, like, this is a note to me. This is, you know, I'm telling myself first and, you know, you can enter it as well. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's what I think. And I, I think it goes back to what Mark was saying earlier as well about, you know, using words as the rope to just climb up each day, you know, when the poetry becomes a tool for healing or just living a life, you know, that's, that's the idea, um, for me anyway. And it's, it becomes a tool for me living my better life, my best life. Mm -hmm. And then if others can enter that space, you know, that's wonderful too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I think that, um, I think that, that the authenticity, it, you know, readers, people, everyone knows when something rings true. And if it rings true, then however it's conveyed is welcome. Yeah. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, if, if I'm holding something back and I use the second person, no, no one, everyone will feel that and say, well, why, you know, why sh give me the evidence and then I can go there with you. That happens in relationships, right? You just can be, you know, with friends or family. And if someone uh, start, you know, they feel like they're pontificating when they don't share their authenticity but they're sharing their conclusions and i think this is one of the you know the great lessons from from playwriting that is so useful in poetry and that is show don't tell it's a very basic principle of playwriting that is really should be in i think every every form we use um, and share the evidence and not our conclusions you know, I think you wrote on your website, um, this, we're all drawn to what we need to learn. And I just, I, 
I think that's so true in those you poems for me, right? Is that this is me feeling some tug into, what did you call it, the Upa Guru? Is the Upa, you... Upa Guru, U-P-A-G-U-R-U. Yes. Yeah. And so there it is, this pull toward the teacher near me and me as student. And it's almost as if the poem then comes from this, this Upa Guru, this whatever it is near me saying, hey, hey, Rosemary. Listen to this. Hey, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your Upa Guru sounds very gentle. <laughs> Do you know? I think I've thought about this. And, you know, they say that the voice that your mother used with you until you were 10 is the, is the, well, I'm probably beyond that, but by 10 o'clock, by 10 years old, you're set. And uh, I happen to have a very gentle, loving, supportive mom and I think that's part of why these other voices I hear tend to be very loving gentle you know hey hey Rosemary check it out instead of oh you idiot although that voice that's in there sometimes too <laughs> uh, um, James do you have another question I have a couple more but do you have something Sure. I mean, I was just going to ask Mark too. Um, you know, we spoke about this a little bit earlier before things began, but just how how do you, as an artist who teaches so much, gives so much, and your work is very generous and giving, and you know, people are drawn to it as as a way of healing. How do you balance that that giving piece um, and that openness? with your own need to have solitude and to work on your own creativity. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who are in that position, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, and, and so let me thank you. That's a wonderful question. Let me speak to it a, a little bit and, and then offer a metaphor around it that really applies to every, everyone because it's, a, it's an archetypal issue. That is, it's something that by being alive, every human being has to negotiate their own rhythm between solitude and community. And, you know, for me, I so love uh, that teaching space and I get so much from it. You know, it fuel, it really fuels me because I work hard to open it like those elder circles as a common authentic space. I don't come to it as an expert, I come to it um, as a, a tender, not the net, but tending, uh, one who tend, tends um, that opening and that space. Um, and so, but even, even when it's all wonderful, there are times when I need to say, I, I need to turn inward and, you know, because it's it, I, I care very much once, once something is out, I care very much about how it's received and if it's clear and all that. But when I'm in that space of, of listening and retrieving and recording what comes through, I do not uh, consider a reader at all. Um, it's the one place that I get to tell the truth even when I'm wrong. And but the metaphor is um, that of whales and dolphins. Mag as magnificent as those creatures are and how they stay under for long periods, they're air breathing creatures. They have to break surface. And as magnificent as they are when they breach, they can't stay there. They have to go back under to immerse their bodies in water in the deep again. And I think that, so as human, as souls and bodies in time on earth, we have to, we have to break surface in order to breathe. We have to come into the world and we can't stay there. We have to immerse ourselves in the deep, but we can't stay there either or we'll drown. Even a whale will drown if it stays down too long. So the question is not whether we will be in the deep or or be in solitude. The question is, what is your personal rhythm? What is your personal healthy rhythm? And are you, for people who are with us today, are you too much on the surface 
right now or too much in the deep? What do you need to do to have a balance? Well, that's a beautiful metaphor for that. Thanks, Mark. There's three more questions that were in the Q&A that I wish we could ask, but we don't have time. <laughs> so <laughs> forgive me, Richard and Tony and Eduardo for not getting to your questions. Um, we're gonna close with each of us reading one last poem. And I do wanna say, wow, Mark, thank you. Wow, that was, this has been incredible for me. Just a heart opening, inspirational, blissful time. <laughs> thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you both. This has been wonderful. Um, so in this, in this poem, I guess, the, uh, the Upa Guru is the poem itself. This is belonging. Forgive me, please, when I, thrilling in how much I love you, believe you belong to me, like a book or a shirt or a ring. Writing that short list, it now seems strange. I believe I own anything. I know well the unstitching of loss. Let me learn to love you loosely, the way I love morning, the way I love song, the way I love hawks on the wing. Let me love you the way I love poems, startled and grateful each time I find it is I who belongs to them. Well, that's beautiful. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Hey, James, your turn. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, that, that is really beautiful. And um, I wanted to say, too, you know, you both make it really difficult as an editor and anthologist because I just want to include all of your poems <laughs> in anthologies and like put them all together. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a good problem to have. Um, so thank you. I, I feel um, very full. By, by this hour together. And um, I just wanna make one more plug for uh, Mark's webinar this summer. You know, I don't know how he does it, but he just spouts wisdom. <laughs> and so if you wanna share that space with him again, it's uh, live.marknepo.com and um, it's called The Life of Expression, starts in June. And um, so consider joining him for that. There you go. So the, the poem that I want to share is called The Promise, and um, we're always waiting for the sound of the, the red-winged blackbirds here that, that mean spring. And so this is about that, The Promise. Barely 10 degrees this morning, yet we heard the liquid trill of red-winged blackbirds perched at the top of a still bare maple, wearing only the blush of buds guarding their green. Just a few hints of that headlong song, and we stopped loading the car, laid down the canvas grocery bags to yell and point up at them, and then they were gone. But not the promise they left with us and planted beneath the layers of iced over snow, gleaming at dawn. You will make it through this. And how did I hear contained in those ancient notes, the water of running brooks, the shimmer of rivers we'll soon dive into again, baptism and risk. How did I hear the swelling and deepening pink of Sakura cherry tomatoes plucked from dusty vines and feasted on in the fields while the tireless light keeps singing across our skin. Well, thank you, James. Also a beautiful, beautiful poem. And thank you both. It's just been a joy to be with you in this space. And thank you for having this space and, and, and honoring it for folks. And I th I'd love to, I'm going to end with the poem, Rosemary, that you were, that you referred to. It's called Free Fall. If you have one hour of air and many hours to go, you must breathe slowly. If you have one arm's length and many things to care for, 
you must give freely. If you have one chance to know God and many doubts, you must set your heart on fire. We are blessed. Each day is a chance. We have two arms. Fear wastes air. Mm. Oh, beautiful. And especially to bring that around with James's very first poem about in every fear, there's a clearing. Um, that was just such a nice full circle. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, James. And a huge thank you again to Shift, to Carrie and Dee and Catherine and all the wonderful people who work at Shift. There is, by the way, another program tomorrow at four o'clock, Dear 2020, uh, a poetry thought shop in which we'll be presenting lots of ideas, poems that other people have written and lots of prompts for you to do your own writing. And if you're interested in that or any other SHIFT program, you can go to shift at milehigh.org. And James, will you say just a little bit about, we're gonna take a little summer break and come back. Yeah, so uh, we'll just take a little break this summer. Um, we're gonna do some of that self-care we were talking about earlier. <laughs> And um, we'll be back in September with a wonderful poet, January Gill O'Neill, um, who'll be joining us then. And that'll be the second Monday in September. So we'll email you all about that and uh, keep you up to date. And everyone who attended today will have a recording of this event. It'll be sent out to you. We thank you all. Thank you so much. Many blessings.